previously on reading and writing skills. In the previous lesson, we talked about the different patterns for text or paragraph development. And there we looked into how each pattern is constructed by focusing on the unique characteristics. We also gave samples in order to provide an illustration of these patterns as they are applied in actual writing. Now in this lesson, we zoom in not just on the pattern, but on the standards that must be observed and met by the different written outputs to ensure the quality of these texts. And with that, good day students and welcome to Reading and Writing Skills Lesson 2, The Properties of a Written Text. For this video, we have the following objectives. Number one, you will be able to identify the different properties of a written text by the end of this lesson. On your own, you will be able to evaluate a text based on the properties of a written text. And hopefully, knowing about these properties, you will now be able to write a composition which observes the properties of a written text. To achieve that, we will talk about the following. First would be the properties of a written text, namely coherence, cohesion, organization, and language and mechanics. Then we will supplement that by giving you tips in how to achieve or in achieving these different properties. So without much ado, let's proceed to our first objective. What are the properties of a written text? Well, now that you have a working knowledge regarding the different patterns of developing texts, you know how they are constructed. We are now going to focus on ensuring that the text or the text, the outline, the essay, the paragraph that you are going to construct is of top-notch quality. And how do we do that? Well, we consider the following properties. We have coherence, organization, cohesion, and language and mechanics. So let's discuss them one by one. What's coherence? Now, coherence is commonly understood as the connection or the interconnection between and among sentences or paragraphs in a text. Now, according to Southeastern Writing Center in 2011, in a way, these statements flow in a smooth manner and it makes the entire paragraph or the entire essay easy to read and understand because it's smooth sailing. The, the reading experience is unencumbered. Now, to supplement this, Forlini et al. mentions that in a coherent essay or paragraph, the statements are not just smooth, they are actually logical because they are arranged in that order, in a logical order with the use of transition words, the repetition of main concepts, and even the summarization of the concepts discussed in the essay or paragraph. So let's bank on that. Let's bank on that understanding that all the points, all the arguments, and all the statements must be arranged in uh, a logical order. Let's keep that in mind. And so to achieve coherence, here are a few tips. First is, again, let's reiterate that the supporting ideas must be arranged in a logical order. Second, after you arrange them in a logical order, we have to put in transition words, which will help in properly uh, transitioning, moving from one point from point A to point B from start to finish in a way that is that is smoother and unencumbered. Three, we have to repeat the main or the key concepts. That way we don't forget what the essay or paragraph is all about. And last but definitely not the least, let us also summarize these main points in the conclusion or have a concluding statement which will encapsulate the thought or the thoughts made in the essay or paragraph. So going back to arranging ideas in a logical order, the first tip, how do we do that? Well, um, there are so many different types of um, logical sequences that you can choose from. But 
among all of those, these are five of the most common orders or sequences that you can choose from. First is the chronological order from the root word chronology, chronos being the titan of time, the father of the Olympian gods and goddesses. This one has something to do with a timeline, expressing or narrating events from start until finish or from start until end. The second one is the spatial order and this has something to do with space or distance. Um, we arrange the components from nearest to farthest or vice versa. We can have the farthest to the nearest based on uh, which approach the writer or the author wishes to take. Third is by order of importance. You rank the concepts according to the most important to the least important or vice versa. Fourth is comparison and contrast. You present the similarities and or the differences of two or more different concepts. And lastly, we have developmental. You discuss the points based on the arrangement in the topic uh, sentence or based on the topic sentence. So everything that you write in your essay or paragraph will be taken from the topic sentence, the, the points made in the topic sentence. So let's go to uh, tip number two. Okay, Now that we have an idea regarding uh, the arrangement, let's now go to what to put in between the statements, which are transition words. Okay, so to supplement the arrangement of the statements in a logical order. Again, uh, we have arranged them in a certain order first, and now we fill in the gaps in between. And we will use transition words. You do that because you want to, to make the transition easier. Therefore, making your essay or your text easier to read because, again, we are aiming for a smooth transition from the beginning of your paragraph or the essay to the end of the paragraph or the essay. So the key term here is fluidity. It has to be fluid. Um, it should not sound like uh, a segmented paragraph where one sentence is isolated from another without connection or subordination. So these transition words will allow your readers to establish mentally the sequence of the different concepts. If you're telling a story from start to finish, then the use of transition words will make it easier for your readers to picture out the sequence of events, which happened first, what happened next, and what happened at the end. Okay, The transition words will help you do that. So let's take a look at the different transition words. Just to give you an example, let's take a look at the different transition words that you might be uh, allowed to use for the different um, orders, the different sequences that you, you may select. Okay, so uh, first we deal with the logical order and then the transition words that you can use under that logical sequence. So pay attention to the table provided. Um, from from a chronological point of view, th these uh, sample transition words may be used. Uh, words like first, after, before, meanwhile, next, now, soon, then, finally, as. The list goes on. For spatial order, you may use words such as above, below, behind, next to, near, inside, outside, adjacent, beyond, from, and then to. For order of importance, you can have first, first point, not first event. This is different from the chronological first. Um, again, for order of importance, we're going for most important to least important. So this is just uh, to state concepts in the order of importance. It's first, second, next, one, moreover, most of all, furthermore, another. For comparison and contrast, okay, again, we're looking at similarities and differences. We can have words such as both, however, in contrast, similarly, like, than, to, instead of, 
also although whereas on the other hand and lastly for developmental order we can have for example for instance in fact consequently in addition in conclusion and furthermore now mind you these are only samples you can have other words you can look for other words and these are just suggestions or in my case these are the most common terminologies or the most common transition words that you can use based on the arrangement that you want to select for your text or your your essay your paragraph so now that we have discussed that let's go to samples okay um, if you want, you can pause this video and just take a look at the sample paragraph. You can see there that I have marked the transition words in blue. Okay, so please feel free to pause this video and then just read through the entire paragraph. Next, we have a sample spatial paragraph. Again, if you want to pause this video, you can do so now and pay attention to the words in blue. These are the transition words that I have used for that paragraph. Next, we have order of importance. Again, you may pause this video and focus on the arrangement of the, the sentences and then uh, keep your eyes fixed on the blue words. These are the transition words that I have used in order to make the paragraph more fluid. And finally, we have a comparison and contrast paragraph. Again, you can uh, pause this video and read through the paragraph so as to understand how these transition words were used in relation to the arrangement selected by the different or the, the respective authors. Okay, now moving on, we have the third uh, tip in achieving coherence, which is the repetition of main or key concepts. So why is this important? This is important because we have to be able to tie back to the thesis statement or the, the main thought in your essay or paragraph. Now these statements may be mentioned repeatedly in the essay. Not word for word, but you may repeat the thought of the thesis statement in your essay or in your paragraph so as to create the impression of tying back, going back to the original topic. Now what this does is to keep your readers fixated on the main concept. Uh, sometimes when an author does not tie back to the thesis statement, then your, the, the essay or the paragraph becomes out of sorts. Okay, uh, it, it now segues into other topics. And this does not lead to coherence. This one uh, leads to disorganization. So um, to give you an example, okay, this is one uh, sample of a paragraph which makes use of repetition. Now take a look at the words marked in bold you have thinking, thought, think, 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 and thinking. See, uh, the same word was used, although in different forms, but the thought is there. The thought remains the same, and it was mentioned repeatedly in the essay. This one creates the impression of a unified uh, thesis statement or a unified, um, a unified topic, which is thinking. So this one is tying back to the original topic. And because of that, we can achieve coherence that way. Because we're not talking about any other topic except the art of thinking. Because that terminology was repeatedly used in the entire essay or paragraph, although in different forms. Okay, we have the last one which is coherence through concluding statements. So while repeating statements will allow you to tie back to the original thought, including or integrating a concluding statement which encapsulates all the points made will give you the impression of neatly tying all these statements in a tight little bow. 
So while the role of the topic sentence is to establish the direction of the essay, okay, that's why it's mentioned usually at the first paragraph or in the first paragraph, so as to give the readers an idea of where the essay or the paragraph deems to go. The role of the concluding statement, on the other hand, is in itself helpful in encapsulating the thought of the entire text. Okay, so if the topic sentence is going to set the direction and the, the body of your paragraph is the journey, then the conclusion is going to give you the destination, a wrapping up of the entire journey. That we have come this far, this is what we went through in the previous paragraphs. So again, this is where you wrap up everything that you have discussed in your text. So I'll give you an example. This one was written by Edith Hamilton in, uh, in her book uh, about Greek mythology. Okay, so the, word of, the world of Greek mythology was not a place of terror for the human spirit. This one is the direction that she wanted to go to, the original thought. It is true that the gods were disconcertingly incalculable. One could never tell where Zeus's thunderbolts would strike. Nevertheless, the whole divine company, with a very few and for the most part not important exceptions, were entrancingly beautiful with the human beauty, and nothing humanly beautiful is really terrifying. So Edith Hamilton ends her paragraph by saying, the early Greek mythologists transformed a world full of fear into a world full of beauty. So this one is the wrapping up of the entire paragraph. At the first part of the, of the paragraph, she mentioned that Greek mythology was not a place of terror. And she ends her paragraph by saying that Greek mythologists have transformed a world full of fear into a world full of beauty. And the topic sentence and the conclusion both agree with one another, which makes everything in the middle um, coherent, line up, they align. Uh, the points made from the beginning of the paragraph down to the last statement in the same paragraph. So it's a matter of alignment. That everything I have said in the middle of these two components are like a sandwich. Okay, They are sandwiched between two coherent um, statements, which is, Greek mythology was not a place of terror, and then Greek mythologists have transformed the world from one of terror to one full of beauty. Very wonderful. And a very perfect example of a coherent paragraph through the use of a concluding statement, which aligns with the topic sentence. So that's that for coherence. We have already discussed all of the four tips. Let's move on to the second property of a written text, which is cohesion. So while coherence focuses on the arrangement of ideas in a text, cohesion, on the other hand, focuses more on the grammatical and semantic, or the word meaning, aspects of the text. We're looking at grammar structures. We're not looking at grammar rules per se, we are looking at grammatical consistency, grammatical structures. And we will also include semantics or word meanings. Now when a text is cohesive or just cohesive, um, all of the items are arranged in a logical order. But just because it is cohesive does not mean uh, or because it is coherent does not mean that it is cohesive, okay? So while we arrange the thoughts in a particular order, we also have to make sure that the grammatical structures in those statements are also consistent. And that is what cohesion is all about. So Raulmi talks about cohesion as something that allows 
your grammatical structures to be properly linked together to help arrive at a common understanding and interpretation of a text. Again, when there are different understandings or you know, different semantic approaches are used, then a common understanding of the text can never be reached. Therefore, a writer must ensure that all of the grammatical and semantic components of the text are sound. So, talking about cohesion, there are two types. We have lexical and grammatical. Let's talk about lexical cohesion first. Now, this refers to the relationships between words and sentence elements. This may be achieved through repetition, synonymy, or to use words with similar meanings, hyponymy, which places a word under a category, meronymy, or to use a word that corresponds to a part that represents the whole or antonymy which uses words with opposite meanings. So some examples are for repetition, birds are beautiful, everybody likes birds. This is cohesion or this is cohesive. Okay, This is an example of cohesion because all of the elements are aligned properly. The first statement talks about the beauty of birds, and the second statement talks about um, how everyone likes birds. They're both talking about birds, so they are cohesive. For synonymy, Paul saw a snake under the mattress. The serpent is going to bite somebody. How is this cohesive? Well, it is synonymy because we used a different term for the word snake. We did not repeat the word snake. Instead, we used the word serpent, which is a synonym of snake. But uh, for the purpose of not making the word snake way too repetitive, we looked for a synonym. We have hyponymy, okay, to place a word under a category. The first sentence is, I saw a cat. And the second sentence was, the animal was very hungry and looked ill. A cat is an animal, or it is part of the animal kingdom. And by that, this is a part, or this is an example of hyponymy. To put a word under the group where it belongs. For meronymy, we assign a part that usually represents the whole. He stopped the car and changed the tire. So when we change tires, we usually refer to an automobile or um, a, a type of transportation, even a bike or a motorcycle. They all have tires and we understood that the person is driving a, a certain mode of transportation because of the tire. The tire is representative of the mode of transportation because most of them have tires. Next, or the last one, we have antonymy, to put words with opposite meanings. First sentence, old movies are boring, or first statement is old movies are boring, the new ones are much better. It is still cohesive because you created a contrast. Again, for, co for, for coherence, we have comparison and contrast. This is what the author used to contrast two statements or two types of movies. And to make it cohesive, uh, the author made use of antonymy, two words with opposite meanings, old movies and new movies. Old and new are antonyms. So for grammatical cohesion, uh, this refers to the grammatical consistency of the statements in the essay or paragraph. Now some of the aspects to look into would be the consistency between noun and the appropriate pronouns or the proper use of, con of conjunctions or substitution substitutions, etc. Allow me to give you an example. First one is anaphora. Anaphora is to use a substitute word at the beginning of each sentence. Okay, for example, um, in the sentences, Jane was brilliant, she got the best score. Anaphora is the re to put the replacement word at the beginning of the sentence. Jane and she. 
they are both found at the beginning of the sentence. Okay, so the anaphora is she. She, the word she, represents Jane. The second one is cataphora. Cataphora is different. This is when you put uh, a substitute word on opposite ends of uh, the two sentences. In the first sentence, here he comes, our hero, and the second sentence has, please welcome John. John is the he in the first sentence, but as you can see, the placement of John and the pronoun he are on opposite sides of their respective sentences. He is found at the beginning of the first sentence, while John is found at the end of the second sentence. This is the opposite of anaphora. Last one, we have conjunctions. Now, we agree on the principle but disagree on the method. Now, as you might know, there are certain rules in terms of conjunctions. Uh, when you are going to connect two thoughts, concepts, or ideas of similar uh, of similar meaning you use the word and when you are giving options you use the word or however when you use two uh, opposing ideas or concepts you use the word but so in this case because agree and disagree are two opposing concepts the conjunction that you are going to use between these statements would be the word but. You cannot use and because agree and disagree are not similar. They are polar opposites. Therefore, the conjunction but must be used. So this one is pretty much uh, common, especially in academic writing. Um, at the beginning of the sentence, you made use of a female character, but the pronouns are not correct. Some of you might write, Jane was brilliant, he got the best score. Obviously, Jane, uh, in this case, is used as a female figure. So therefore, the pronoun should not be he, it must be she. So we look for grammatical consistency. If you are pertaining to a female figure, then by all means, um, grammatical rules would tell you that you have to use pronouns meant for a woman or a female figure. Then if it is male, then the pronouns assigned must be for the males. Now, that being said, uh, that, that is all for cohesion. Let's now look at organization. Okay, so now we know the logical order and the consistency of uh, the grammatical structures and the semantic entries. Now it is time for you to apply um, these concepts in terms of constructing your draft or even your outline. So organization looks into the arrangement of the ideas in the text based on the order that you have selected for it. So for example, you are writing an essay about my most embarrassing experience ever. You try to select an approach. Is it going to be the logical approach? This go is it going to be an order of importance approach? Is it going to be developmental? It's totally up to you. Now, once you have decided a particular order for that, now it is time to arrange the ideas in that particular order. If it's chronological, then you have to make sure that you arrange the ideas in chronological order from start until finish. And that is what organization does. How do you ensure organization? Well, there is just one tip. And this tip has been with you, or you've been practicing this tip uh, since last semester. This is through the use of an outline. It is only through the outline that you are able to visualize the entries before you write the actual essay or paragraph. And it makes it much easier for you to edit and rearrange the entries because they are not yet in full sentences. Okay, 
Last one, we have language and mechanics. And this is pretty much self-explanatory. Uh, as we have covered the aspects of detail and structure, we now go to the other aspects of proper writing, which are of equal importance. And these are language and mechanics. Uh, this one has something to do with word selection or diction. And this falls under language and the different rules and grammar and composition which must be observed by the writer. These are also vital in the writing process because these two will affect the impact that a text will have on the readers. I always tell my students, it does not matter how beautiful the topic is, if your essay is written poorly, if the grammatical structures are not consistent, then you will never be able to achieve your desired effect. You have to make sure that your essay or your paragraph is free or almost free of any errors in spelling, punctuation, and grammar. And make sure that you follow the mechanics. If your instructor, your teacher, your professor tells you to come up with a five-paragraph essay, then come up with at least a five-paragraph essay. If your teacher tells you to submit 300 words, then do not submit a paragraph that bears only 200 words. Follow the mechanics. Follow the instructions because they are there for a reason. So, that being said, I believe that wraps up our lesson for today. For the references, if you want to know where I got my information, then you may refer to the following sources. The links are there. All, all you need to do be to type in the link and um, you, know, you will be able to read through the materials found in those sources. And with that being said, that ends our lesson for today. This has been Sir Dardar, class dismissed.